Well, welcome everybody to today's Alumni and Partners online seminar. And on this occasion, we are going to talk about communication without words. My name is Maria Laura Sorrentino. I'm alumni officer at IG Delft. And it's, to please, it's my pleasure to be the moderator today. Before going to present our speakers, I would like to remind you that we are in an interactive web seminar and on the right button you will find out the chat box where I would like to invite you to write your name, your country and the organization that you are working so that to facilitate our networking. And after that, to post all the questions you would like to do to the speakers. We are going to collect them and after, in the second part of the seminar, we are going to post them and they will address all the questions. Today we have two speakers, Lenke Konop and Aaron Abhishek. Both, they work in the Water Channel. They work with us in uh, organizing these seminars that are organized by Tai Chi with the, net, with the support and, uh, of uh, the Water Channel. Leneke has experience in natural resources management and communication. She has worked more than 12 years in areas of natural resources management, such as spate irrigation, water supply and sanitation, and groundwater management. Over that time, she has also designed and delivered communication trainings for water sector professionals, educational institutions and community-based organizations in the Netherlands, Bangladesh, Kenya and Ethiopia. Abraham Abhishek has worked as a broadcast journalist, a researcher and a communication expert also for over than 12 years, most recently in the field of water management. Over that time, he has produced several videos and design management, managed projects applying videos and photography as tools of research and learning. They will present the seminar of communication without words, a framework of communication for collaboration, research and horizontal learning, and how tools like videos and infographic can help you to implement in the water management. Saying all that, I would like to give the word to Abraham and Leneke for their presentation. Thank you very much, Maria, for the introduction. And it's a pleasure to be here because usually we are on your seat, being the facilitator, but today we are uh, very happy and honored to say something about communication. So I'm happy to see all of you here. I see already many people that um, we've known from the past, so um, very welcome. And um, I hope everybody can also hear us because I just received a comment that it was not so clear, but I don't see anybody complaining at this moment, so I am happy to continue. So, today we're going to talk about communication, but in the context of water and agriculture. And as you have maybe read already in the announcement, we started with three facts that might be a bit unknown. And um, did you know that of all land that is irrigated, 20% is too salty to farm. This means that 1.6 million hectares are lost every year. Or another fact, did you know that in just over a decade we lost groundwater equivalent to 40 million Olympic-sized swimming pools? And last but not least, did you know that due to human activity many deltas are sinking five times faster than that sea levels are rising? And seeing all of you being partners, alumni from IHE and also uh, partners from the other, uh, from the complete water sector. I'm trying to move a bit closer to the microphone, maybe that helps for this. In the water sector and in uh, agricultural programs. But how to do it and um, what is most effective, that is something that we would like to uh, give our view on. So, what we want to share today in this webinar is some of our own experiences. As Maria already introduced us, we are uh, Abraham Abhishek is sitting next to me and I am Lenneke Knoop. We work on the Water Channel and besides that, we also work in water and agriculture related programs. And we work all over the world. We have many programs in the Horn of Africa, but we are also active in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, 
uh, Turkey, Nepal, and yeah, many other countries as well. So in the upcoming 40 minutes, we would like to share some experiences that we, uh, from programs that we are in ourselves. And um, we work with a wide variety of partners, but also beneficiaries. So very often our end users are farmers, but we also work a lot with academics, with other companies, with NGOs at government level. So it's this context that we are operating in. And from that point of view, it's also the experience that we would like to share. So when we think about communication, we had a long discussion here. What are we exactly going to tell? So I think that most of us um, associate communication initially with dissemination. And um, thinking about dissemination, there are also many ways how to disseminate a message. You can think about how you phrase a certain message, how you bring it out, how you visualize it, etc. But also communication is much more than dissemination only. So these are the things we're going to discuss in the following minutes. First, I'll give you an example on something related to dissemination. Then we're going to show how communication can also be used as a tool for collaboration then how communication can be used as a research tool. And in the end, we would like to show you how communication is not a tool anymore, but becomes an end in itself. And if you have questions, please post them in the meantime in the chat box, and uh, they will be collected, as Maria Laura already said. So dissemination. I would like to show you an example from China. What we did, um, funded by the Dutch government, we started in 2014 a program called Piloting Artificial Recharge. We did this with a big group of Dutch partners in cooperation with the Chinese uh, partners and government over there. The idea was to pilot artificial wetlands and there was, or I, sorry, I, artificial recharge and there was an idea behind it. So the Deyang area, which is located in the southwest of China, it was struck hard by an earthquake in 2008. And since then, reconstruction has taken, so the population grew a lot, and with that also the demand for water. Um, and the water supply of the city could not really match the water demand that was happening over there. Then the second thing that I thought was very interesting, because it was an earthquake prone area, um, storing water above ground, was was at a risk because if there's an earthquake those tanks could be broken down so making water underground available would make more sense in areas like these so what we did through this program we wanted to construct a wetlands park to store clean water underground that could then be used for drinking water supply now in this slide you can see a design and you can also see google earth images of what was actually happening so in the above um, in the above picture, you can see that there is a river. So what actually happened was the river water from Yan Yuan River was pumped into the park. And in the park, it uh, went through a purification process. So first the water entered a um, flocculation basin. Then it went through artificial wetlands where the plants would filter the water. And after that, it would go into an infiltration bed. Those were very uh, large sand basins. The water would drip down through the sand, where the sand would naturally filter the water further. And then it would just recharge the groundwater to be pumped up later for the water supply company. Now, having said all this, it seems like a rather technical program, but that is not why I am here in this webinar. So these are a few uh, of the uh, pictures while constructing the park. So what we wanted to do, because it was also quite a new technique in this area, is to also show to the people who were visiting it, because it was a beautifully laid out park, what is actually happening to water and why is the choice made to have it stored underground. So we did two things. There was a visitor center, so that was a separate building made into the design. You can see it in the bottom picture. It's a yellow building, very far, it was quite big. But at the same time, we also want to um, inform the people who were visiting the park, like what is happening at all these different components. So for example, maybe for us as water people, we know what a sedimentation basin is, but a random resident from uh, the neighborhood probably might not. So what we did, we placed all these uh, panels next to the components and made sure that the information was given. How the visitor center looked was like this. So inside what we did 
we took the opportunity not only to explain the park components, but also to explain the hydrological circle and water management and its challenges in a city like this in general. Hey, I see that my sound is gone. Can you hear me? Sometimes. Maybe activate your microphone. What I'll do, I'll try to activate another microphone. So now I have. Now I have I have two microphones. My computer. So now I'm using the other microphone. I hope this is helping a bit better. Just wait for some reply. Yes. No. Before it was better. Okay, I'll continue and then my colleague uh, plugs in or plugs out whatever is most convenient. I have the feeling the other one, so we'll go back to that. Okay, so we are back to the other microphone. So I'm back again using another microphone and this is the only option that we have at this moment. So I hope that everybody hears it. I'm sorry for these technical glitches. This is uh, what happens with live design. I hope everybody uh, was following the China example. So in the end what I was mentioning is that in the visitor center we took the opportunity to not only talk about park components and not only about technical things that are you know, irritating oceans and water, but also to take the opportunity to inform on a much broader scale on uh, water management and the water cycle in general. So that is what we did over there. And because we uh, have seen the yeah, success of it, we're also trying to implement this now in Ethiopia. This is another example. We are not constructing this treatment plant, but this treatment plant is already there in Legedari. And um, I still see there are some difficulties with following the sound. Okay, then what I suggest, I'll try one thing, but then I need to have a bit of patience from you, like a one minute patience, and I'll just try to pick some other options. And I hope you will stay with me for one minute and I'll freeze my uh, video, but we'll fix the audio. Maybe it should work now. Maar hij is echt ingeplugd. Oh, bij jou. Oké, okay, I'm back again. Can you hear me? I just want to see if you people 
Saying yes or no? Okay, great. Okay, thank you for this. And sorry for keep you waiting and having these uh, microphone issues. Yeah, I got it so warm, I had to take my jacket off. So <laughs> what I wanted to say, maybe to sum up, so we saw that the example of China was successful, and we also are now going to implement this in Legadadi in Ethiopia. The difference with China is that we did not uh, have to build a treatment plant or whatever, because that was already existing. But in this case, what we want to do is to take the opportunity that is already there. Um, at the Legadadi treatment plant, school kids are visiting every week the plant, and they get like an instructional talk or what is going on, but we want to uh, exploit that further. So what has happened, there is already a building uh, constructed. It's also meant for training purposes, but it's not in use. So what we are doing, we're going to make a visitor center in it, and also, like we did in China, we want to have the whole um, outside part as an education um, input as well. So each component, we are trying to make panels and explanation posters that will show the kids what, uh, what is actually happening on site. Now, both of these examples are very much examples of dissemination. So that might be one of the first things that you think about when you talk about communication, how to disseminate the knowledge that we have, how to share it with another audience, how to share it to the whole world. It's just one of the first things that you think about of when we are talking about communication. But another way that we have seen communication working successfully is through collaboration. I'll give you two examples of um, types of collaboration that we have done in the past. The first one is called the Flood-Based Livelihoods Network Foundation. So this uh, network already started in 2004. We felt the need to promote a certain topic. In this case, it was spate irrigation or other types that are um, flood-based systems. You can see some examples on the slides at the left side. And we wanted to promote stability and socio-economic development in areas where all these livelihoods are depending on floods. And yeah, good to know also that these are usually among the poorest areas in the countries. And what the network tries to do is to strengthen farmer networks, but also to include other stakeholders. And it helps not only with networking, but also with implementing real programs on exchanging good economic and social practices. Now, communication plays a very important role in that. So um, this is an example of um, how we are hosting this network. So first of all, um, we developed a website to give it an own identity. And together with the partners, we are creating a series of magazines. We call them practical notes. And we have captured many lectures of different people who are involved in the network. And one of the results with capturing all these uh, lectures is that we could actually turn it with another partner into a real online course. So um, up to date, this uh, net network is still very active, and there are many activities uh, hanging under it. Another example of this is what we call the Roads for Water Learning Alliance. And I think many of you know what is Roads for Water, or what we call Roads Water Harvesting or Management. But this picture of Eric Nissen Peterson is one of the pictures that I uh, personally like most. It's taken from a helicopter, and you can see that a road is leading water into a hillside pond, which is then later on used for domestic use, but also for um, livestock. So um, we have set up this learning alliance, and we do that also because um, we think road water harvesting is one of these topics that deserve a lot of attention, but it doesn't get too much attention. So when the topic is um, specific in and interesting enough, we develop these networks and try to link all relevant persons, um, um, key stakeholders into it. And this is an infographic showing that, yeah, OK, what, what are the activities that you can do under it? And again, also for this Roadswater Alliance, very important thing is communication. This is an example of infographics that we have developed around the theme. It's visually showing what the impact of road water harvesting can be, how we can link to each other, and we're also collecting farmer stories. So it, this is a part of the website where everything is put together visually. So to sum up, with collaboration, um, we can create networks like these. And, and there is a wide package of communication tools that is necessary to keep these alive. 
It includes websites, social media, and extensive use of videos. This also what we have seen happening, it stimulates co-creation and uh, I think one of the most important things is that it has its own identity. So that means that nobody claims it and what we often see and also prefer is that everybody owns it. So having said that, um, we would like to continue to another example of using communication and that is where my colleague Abraham will take over. So I'll move the mic to him. And he will explain something more about how to use communication as a research tool. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Can everybody hear me? Hear me? See me? Okay. Great. So, uh, thanks, Lanika. Uh, I will try to share uh, some insights about uh, um, using communication as a research tool. Um, and yeah, yeah, okay. And uh, what I mean by by that is, um, um, if we look at communication as a process uh, or a set of tools that can be uh, used for research, we will find that uh, it is really useful. Uh, specifically, uh, um, we will look at an example of how participatory photography can be used to uh, collect, uh, you know, uh, qualitative data and how it can help capture insights that we will struggle to capture through interviews and focus group discussions. Next slide. Images by themselves are a valuable kind of data, visual data. We capture images as part of data collection all the time. Uh, when images are captured through a participatory process, so when the subjects of the research or the people whose responses we are trying to capture themselves produce the images, then the data acquires an additional dimension. It gains quality. Uh, because through a participatory process, we get from the respondents not just the responses, but a story that they have taken some time to create themselves. So the in insights we get from uh, such stories is very layered, it's very rich, it's of a very high quality. And it can inform policy and follow-up actions in a very effective way. Um, so uh, to give you an example um, from Ethiopia, sorry, I'm just trying to uh, make sure I have the order of the slides right. OK. To give you an example of Ethiopia, uh, we tried to uh, implement this, uh, um, uh, this methodology uh, in a place in uh, 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 Ethiopia's northern Tigray province. What we were trying to do was we were trying to, um, uh, to collect from a community, uh, from a rural community in that region. Uh, insights about how they use uh, roads, how um, um, uh, like uh, 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 how good are roads, um, you know, what they consider are good roads, uh, what is the operation uh, and, and, and maintenance process of roads like, and how uh, we can get, uh, and if there are any differentials between women and men when it comes to road usage, like when it comes to how they use roads, and when it comes to um, uh, the benefits that they accrue from roads. So uh, this exercise uh, was carried out uh, um, by about 24 women, sorry, uh, not 12 as is mentioned here. And uh, this is how it was done. Oh. I'm sorry, just slightly lost with the slides. Okay. Okay. So um, it's not there in the slides, but I'll just try to walk you through uh, the process of what something like this looks like. Uh, we form groups of three or four to mo to make sure that there's some discussion back and forth between the group, um, and then we have a short focus group discussion regarding the topic. So in this case, the topic being roads and roads access. Uh, the idea is to get participants to start thinking about the topic, its different aspects. 
and from there the discussion can move on to uh, planning what they would like to shoot. Uh, so when they do go out to shoot, they make this uh, they make decisions through discussions and consensus, and they use time optimally. Uh, after they come back from the shoot, uh, they show to the larger group the pictures that they have taken, and they sort of make a presentation of the pictures, explaining what they have shot, why they have shot it, and how it ties in with the larger discussion. Uh, what the facilitator can do, uh, what the facilitator, sh uh, what the facilitator should do, um, is guide the discussion about the topics at hand, and maybe provide some general tips about taking pictures, how to frame, how to make good use of light, etc. It's important here to not get too deep into the process of photography because that will be a distraction. Uh, besides, these days people have smartphones. Everybody has a smartphone, or many people do, and they are quite familiar with the process of. Uh, taking pictures and the picture, uh, the picture resolution, uh, the picture quality is not really uh, of uh, the highest importance here in this case. Okay, so uh, I'll show you some pictures of what uh, the participants in this exercise came back with. Uh, so this, for example, um, is uh, is one of them. This observation was specifically about internal village roads. So these are the roads on which people walk to get from A to B within the village and uh, to walk up to the feeder road uh, that sort of connects them to the, uh, to the nearest town or the, to the nearest market. Um, this picture and the presentation that accompanied it highlighted that rains can make roads slippery and apart from like breaking them outright. And how that poses a very specific challenge, especially to pregnant women who can fall down and this their pregnancy can be affected. And this photograph and this insight could become a basis to start a discussion with road authorities to use certain kinds of stones in the construction of such roads uh, that become less slippery during rains. Um, one of the biggest benefits women saw of good quality roads was that they enabled repairmen to reach them very quickly. Uh, if the local water points were not repaired and maintained regularly, for women it means walking to another one uh, which is far and it means more time spent on fetching water. Uh, this was different than the responses of men who pointed out that the primary of, uh, function of roads is to provide access to the market in the city where they could buy to sell their stuff. Uh, the exercise also revealed that women and men experience transport in different ways. Men do not think there was much wrong with the transport options available, um, but lots of women took pictures uh, of uh, taxis and buses. And while presenting those pictures, they spoke about how crowding and sexual harassment are big enough factors that they affect them greatly. Uh, sometimes women prefer to walk 10 kilometers, uh, which costed them up to three hours, rather than take a crowded bus. And this particular picture and this insight highlighted some of the ancillary benefits of road construction um, uh, process that women draw, like when the road is being constructed. At a road construction site, women make money by selling tea, coffee, lunch, and snacks. Um, and this was a basis, this insight was a basis to suggest to the local Department of Road Transport and Agriculture, which is in charge of uh, building rural roads, to systematically engage local women as caterers. So uh, that was an example of uh, communication as a research tool. Um, yeah, that was an example of communication as a research tool. And we will now look at an example of communication as an end in itself. Now, uh, what does that mean? Um, um, so uh, here we would like, by talking about this, uh, we would like to make the point that sometimes communication is the core activity and the core uh, objective. Um, the rural communities we work with have uh, ways of communication, of sharing knowledge. Uh, I think I've been lost. Yeah, OK. Um, so uh, I was saying that uh, we will not talk about using communication as an end in itself. 
Um, and here we would like to make the point that sometimes communication is the core activity or the end objective. Uh, so we often work with rural communities and uh, they have ways of, uh, uh, of, sh of sharing knowledge and information with each other. Uh, and a lot of this information has to do with water, agriculture and rural livelihoods which are points of our intervention as well. And uh, sometimes what helps to improve water management and uh, sometimes that helps uh, to, uh, um, to improve agriculture, to achieve a particular change in the field of agriculture is to improve, uh, um, uh, uh, like to support and build the capacities and processes with which these communities learn and share new information uh, within themselves. So we talk about horizontal learning. Horizontal learning essentially is peer-to-peer -peer learning within communities of practice. And in the context of agriculture and water management, um, they can be, it, it can be used to stimulate farmer-to-farmer -farmer sharing of innovative agricultural practices. Um, external intervention uh, involves helping set up these communities of practice, uh, designing learning platforms for the use of, uh, the, uh, of these communities, and providing training and support the, that they might need to utilize the platform. Uh, we will discuss this in a bit more detail in subsequent slides. So um, here we will talk about uh, video-based horizontal learning, which is uh, the sum and substance of an intervention that we are trying to implement in Bangladesh as uh, the Watch Channel. Um, we, uh, we are trying here to, uh, through the use of uh, smartphones, through the use of uh, um, videos and by videos we mean simple videos, the kind that uh, we can make we can make and share with smartphones to uh, accelerate the process of horizontal learning, which is already happening uh, within communities. And uh, uh, the uh, the subsection of the communities that we are trying to target are water management groups, and these water management groups are set up uh, within the polder regions of Bangladesh. Uh, and they are in charge of the day-to-day -day, uh, water management, the opening of the gates, uh, and uh, the uh, solution to problems like salinization, uh, uh, sedimentation, and uh, flooding, and, and stuff like that. Um, so, like I said, uh, this is about stimulating the use of videos for documenting and sharing of good practices. Uh, and the focus is on easy videos. Again, the, um, what we are focusing on is not to provide um, the participants, the community skills that will enable them to become filmmakers, but skills that will enable them to uh, capture and share uh, good agricultural practices in a fast and effective way. And the focus uh, invariably is on youth and women, especially uh, youth. Uh, because it is the use that uh, that uh, um, has like cell phone use as their second nature. So just to uh, illustrate what I just said, this is like a schematic representation of the process that we are trying to achieve here. Um, so there is the, uh, I'll try and use the cool um, pointer over here. Which I don't have. Okay. Ah, yeah, there you go. So here we have uh, the water management, the water management groups. They're already there, and they already have some uh, existing uh, platforms and processes through which they share information. They share uh, and uh, uh, they share uh, they share good practices. So these could be in the form of um, uh, physical events such as meetings and fairs and harvesting festivals. Uh, this could also be in the form of uh, uh, virtual platforms such as social media. And I see a question coming about internet connectivity. In the particular case of Bangladesh, in internet connectivity is uh, rather good and it is increasing year on year. What is increasing year on year is uh, uh, the strength of, the, um, of, of mobile internet available and the use of smartphones. So uh, like a lot more people every year are uh, becoming uh, um, internet users, smartphone users. Um, 
and in Bangladesh also this is something specific to uh, to that country there are um, um, like uh, information brokers or information service service providers such as things called union digital centers which are the essentially local enterprises subsid uh, subsidized by uh, the local government where a local entrepreneur sets up a shop where he offers uh, internet based services for example he offers connectivity to the internet or he offers some IT based services for example printing and uh, browsing and filling online forms and uh, submitting applications for passport checking the price of crops etc and of course there is the the mass media as is the case in most countries uh, the mass media is there and especially in the case of Bangladesh the number of newspapers that are out there the number of TV, uh, of TV channels that cater to uh, communities including rural communities is rather large so uh, these are the this is the community and here are the platforms with which they share information they share insights and knowledge with each other and the arrows are points of intervention we have the smartphone video training that uh, I mentioned uh, we have screenings of videos that uh, um, the community has produced but also videos that we have produced or videos that already exist about good practices that the community that we know the communities will find useful and uh, um, another intervention another point of intervention is uh, um, competition uh, we also provide um, uh, we also uh, in, in order to as an incentive as a stimulant to get people to implement what they have learned in the smartphone video trainings we organize competitions where people can submit as entries videos they have uh, produced capturing a good agricultural practices and the top three in each round of competition wins an award so we show all these kinds of uh, videos in the training and what happens as a result of all this is uh, the sharing of uh, good practices is accelerated it widens and as I mentioned uh, Facebook is big in Bangladesh or uh, and uh, including rural Bangladesh so uh, we have put together a Facebook group which is uh, uh, kind of the Facebook platform for this particular project um, um, and uh, their uh, farmers, uh, the videos they make, they share. And just to put some number, some numbers to this program, what we are talking about in the case of this particular intervention is ten, tra uh, 10 trainings, uh, which covers around two, uh, 250 participants, uh, and it, it covers around 50 water management groups. Uh, 50 video screenings and what uh, this intervention will generate by the end of it uh, will 100 plus is 100 plus videos made by farmers actually by the look of things it will be in excess of 300 uh, videos um, 300 farmer produced uh, videos that uh, will capture good water management and agricultural practices in the region and uh, uh, through the project and uh, as an effect of the project after it is over uh, hopefully the activities uh, the, uh, these good practices will be shared amongst uh, WMGs uh, even wider and this is a screen cap that shows you what uh, like a farmer produced videos a video could look like we uh, thought we could play a video for you but uh, we don't have enough time so uh, looking at these examples that we have seen um, so far in this presentation, some from Lenica, some from me, we have seen at uh, video uh, and how it can be used as a research tool. Uh, we have seen video, uh, 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 sorry, we have seen uh, um, uh, visual uh, communication and how it can be used as a research tool. So it could be videos or photographs. Uh, we have seen how communication can be an end in, it, an end in itself. Um, uh, strength and communication process could be the very thing we are trying to achieve as we saw in the case of uh, uh, the horizontal learning project from Bangladesh. And we also looked at communication as a tool of collaboration. So what have we learned from all this so far? Uh, at this point, I would like to look at Lenica who would perhaps like to um, Yes. Take us through the rest of it. Definitely. Yeah, so we were thinking what kind of messages would we like to give to you um, based on our own experience. Now, over the past 12 years, there are more things that we have learned. 
just to make you feel a bit more comfortable. But I think one of the first and biggest lessons was that audience will not magically appear. And that uh, a lot of things change over time. I remember that one of the first programs that I was working in, one of the ideas was to make a new platform. And then I was realizing we have so many platforms already. Why don't we just use things that are already there or maybe tap into certain channels? Because what often happens, and that was then also the case, we introduce the platform. Maybe we spend some time uh, at the launching event or announcing it. We dedicate a few newsletters to it. And then if we don't do anything, people will not come. And that is very often underestimated. And then another thing that we learned is that Communication is not for communication experts only. I mean, we have uh, some communication backgrounds ourselves, but the majority that we did was not in communication. So we strongly believe that it would be fantastic if you can embed communication somehow in your workflow. And that is what I see ourselves doing. However, thinking that everybody will embed communication in the workflow is another utopia. So it's something as we have preached quite often, but we also realize and have to be realistic there, if you are not completely into it, you will not adopt it. But the positive note I would like to mention here is that many people can do much more than they uh, are aware of um, and that they know. And that is also my last point. There are very much tools available nowadays um, with just a bit more of investment time in that. You can uh, share your messages at much more platforms or in a wider context than you are ever doing. And we had this conversation recently in light of open databases. So um, often people are not aware of the fact there are so many open databases, then I'm talking about satellite images, etc., that we are looking for the most difficult and expensive way to retrieve them. So a few tools that we like to use communication-wise is, for example, Campasia. It's not completely free. Um, there is a free version, but you will have a watermark in it. What it does, it captures your screen. So if you have a presentation, just a PowerPoint presentation, you can, um, you can record that with your own face next to it, and you can just upload it to YouTube, Water Channel, or wherever you would like to do it. And it, it has been very successful for us, because that was one of the reasons why the spade irrigation uh, lectures, for example, were turned into an online course. Another thing that uh, I like to use myself a lot is called pick to chart And what this does is it makes infographics. I'm sure you all know what infographics are, or you can imagine how you can visualize certain messages. You see it a lot nowadays. I think even Coca-Cola used it a year ago to um, explain their annual numbers. So it's just a, a visualization of data that could be maybe a bit boring, but if you present it more visually, it makes a lot of difference. And pick to charge already has a lot of templates in it. And that's why these tools are so fantastic to use. You don't need to reinvent the wheel, or you don't need to be a Photoshop or an Illustrator expert. And the open databases we just discussed. So with that message, I would like to conclude this webinar. Um, and we would continue, like to continue to the questions if you have. And give the floor back to Very much, Maria Laura. Thank you and Abraham. Very much. So yes, it's a start. Uh, it's a time to start if our Laura question and there. answers. People are uh, posting questions, so I will start with the first one. Mm -hmm. I will read it <laughs> later. Okay, and the, I need also to, 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 to know who posted. But the first question is, what is the quality and depth of internet connectivity, particularly in rural Ethiopia, from the case studies? Uh, I guess I'll take this question uh, in the context of for the two cases that I presented. So. Uh, Internet connectivity in Ethiopia at the moment uh, is, uh, especially in rural Ethiopia, is limited, but it is growing. Uh, if we compare uh, how things are now, how good connectivity now is to five years ago, uh, it has improved a lot. Um, and uh, in the case of Bangladesh, uh, on the other hand, internet connectivity is al already very good and growing. Um, um, uh, 
people lost me. Can you? Okay, I guess you can still hear me, so I'll go on. Uh, so yeah, uh, so in case of Bangladesh, uh, rural internet connectivity is much better. Um, Thank you, Temba, for your question. Growing, and we will pass to the second day. one. That comes from, I suppose, Doshis is the name. And the question is, can religious leaders and worship centers play a role in sharing these good practices? Yeah, maybe I can answer. Uh, I think churches, worship centers are very important um, key points also in sharing information. And we have seen it especially in Kenya, but I think also in Bangladesh, I'm looking to Abram now, that we use the places also to announce things like complex, etc., or to share the message, or to even um, invite participants to take place participate in a training? Uh, yeah, I mean, religious leaders uh, already play a, 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 a very important role uh, in, in water management uh, in rural communities. I mean, rural communities are built around uh, activities that are essentially uh, agriculture slash water management. And uh, the uh, religious organizations are there, churches, mosques, and they already play an important role, including in the role of pro including related to the promotion of good practices. Uh, we have seen this both uh, in Bangladesh and in Ethiopia. And if we design, uh, if we approach them uh, properly, we can Thank actually very much. And, uh, leverage the outreach they already have within the community. The question that comes so. from India, from Doctor, oh, you escape it. Well, I continue with the force, and you return to that one. A fourth question, and we'll go back to the third one. Give me the fourth, otherwise. Huh? Okay. Oh, it's really big. Sorry. Okay. It's from Simon that would like to thank all the presentations that you have done, and he says it seems about that a lot of capturing and sharing information. How about information demand in the field? Can you say the horizontal learning is an example of leaf sender receiver? Can you comment on that, please, Leneke and Abram? Yeah, uh, so I'll take that. Um, uh, in terms of uh, demand for Im information in the field, yeah, we have to essentially uh, inform ourselves, uh, educate ourselves as to what the demands are. And uh, we do that by uh, involving local communities in the process, uh, including at the stage of program design. So um, when what we are, uh, as I mentioned, what we are trying to do is not to set the agenda. We are not trying to identify the good practices ourselves. But uh, we, are, uh, we are giving rural communities, in the case of Bangladesh, um, water management groups that already exist and they already have their own priorities and agenda. We are giving them tools that they can use to boost uh, the processes through which they are already sharing good practices. So uh, where they were using Facebook before and they were mostly using uh, text and words, now they are also uh, uh, using videos to share good practices on Facebook. So they're still using Facebook but in a boosted way. So to answer the question, the way to take that, to take into account the local demands for information is to make sure that the point of intervention is uh, restricted to uh, pro uh, like uh, introduction of tools. Uh, and uh, um, in terms of program design and in terms of setting the agenda, it is the local communities that take charge. And maybe one thing to add. Because I think the whole horizontal learning access strategy followed actually some of the experiences that we had before. So of course there are things going on already like farmer field schools, exchange visits, one RUA visiting the other one. And we saw that those things are really working out very well. And to have it strategized, if I can say it that way, we can... Thank you very much. And uh, right we are going on. to go to India. And uh, it's Dr. Bisha Kumar that... Uh, made the next question, very practical one. Were the water management groups really enthusiastic, voluntary? Is there any system to break them in? 
So I don't know who of you would like to start. So uh, this is about uh, the example from Bangladesh, I suppose, so I will take that. Um, were the water management groups uh, really enthusiastic? Well, uh, um, when we initiated the conversation with them, there was a healthy amount of skepticism um, um, amongst them uh, about uh, like, you know, how useful this training was for them, uh, how relevant this was uh, to their context, to what extent was this something that they would be able to uh, apply in their work. And uh, uh, this, uh, based on, on, on this interaction, we made a selection of participants in the program and we decided to focus a bit more on the youth uh, that were already using smartphones, that were already using smartphones to make and share videos. Uh, they were already doing this as second nature. Uh, so um, there, uh, there was an emphasis on youth and uh, after uh, in the early days of the program or in the early stages of the interaction, there was more skepticism, uh, less enthusiasm, but as uh, the conversation went on, and especially after the training, um, uh, enthusiasm increased and skepticism decreased. So uh, this is what happened. I guess to answer your question, um, we just need to talk to the communities. We need to pitch this idea to the communities, and we need to make really good arguments. That, I think you uh, would you like um, to comment? Uh, this is something very relevant to them. Yeah, I think um, it depends a lot also on which community you're aware and what is the topic. So I usually uh, experience a lot of enthusiasm, but what I notice is that sometimes the expectations are a bit different. So then in the beginning, um, for example, especially when you focus on communication, people already think about communication only as a separate thing next to the content that we are working on. So for example, I was a few weeks ago, I was in Kenya and the, the uh, training, it was similar to what Abram did in Bangladesh, but then a smaller, in smaller size, so to say. And then people expect that you are going to learn every about, everything about video, and that is not the case. So then once they can see the connection and that they can shoot their own images from their own farm and then explain it to neighboring farmers, then that Perfect. Makes it uh, we have still two uh, questions question. and we are doing very That's good with I the time. Do. So the uh, next question is for Motas. And what criteria should we follow to choose suitable factors if needed, he asked. Or she asked, I don't know. I think he refers to photo voice. That's what I think, but I'm ah. not sure if that's the case, Morta. Uh, to choose a suitable facilitator. Uh, well, there are several things that would make someone the right facilitator in the context of uh, a horizontal learning exercise, in the context of a participatory photography exercise. Um, but one thing that I would like to emphasize upon and that cannot be emphasized upon enough uh, is if the facilitator, the best case scenario is if the facilitator is one of them. Uh, farmers are most convinced if uh, uh, it is a new farm, it, it is a farmer like them who is uh, um, like uh, who is giving them new information, who is saying that uh, this uh, way of doing things is good or who is uh, uh, sort of uh, teaching them uh, basics of photography or teaching them uh, the basics of how to make uh, videos using smartphone. So what really helps if it is somebody who is uh, connected enough, who has a certain degree of connection to the local context, uh, who either comes from the community or uh, is uh, like from that general area so he can communicate well with the community. Uh, that really helps. In Bangladesh, it helps that the facilitators we use are Bengali. Uh, it helps that I can speak some Bangla. Uh, so and often that can flies. be a critical and So factor we are going stuff. to arrive to the last question. Um, Nothing to add. Sorry. And it's from Mika. And he or she asks if you have collected also written contents or you only work with videos and pictures or photos. Yeah, I can answer that question. So what we try to stimulate our colleagues, 
So um, is to write blogs when we are abroad. So when we are talking about implementing programs or trainings, we mostly focus on videos and photos. But um, for the team itself, we are stimulating uh, a lot to also write and to share experiences with photos and uh, with written text. And also we have, uh, for example, last year there was a big group here in the Netherlands all related to the flood-based farming um, livelihood network. And they wanted to become leaders in their topic. And then, for example, we organized these uh, how to write blogs, what we call power writing. So yeah, we do really value the um, impact that also text has. And um, we work with that. But well, we have an extra question of one of my colleagues. I cannot uh, say no, yeah. but you have to be brief. And the question of Nadine is, what were the best practices for you and why? Do you have some do's and don'ts tips for making communication successful? And this will be our last question. Yeah. <laughs> we can dedicate a whole webinar to that. Um, well, One point I could make in response to this uh, question is like this very general point of making sure that uh, like uh, the choice of the tool we can make sure we have to make sure that the choice of the tool uh, is based upon the need rather than uh, like uh, the choice of implementation of a tool informed by the fact that we own that tool uh, i don't know if that's very clear but uh, like for example um, participatory photography like uh, when we decide to do participatory uh, photography somewhere uh, it should be um, uh, it should that should be that decision should be taken on the basis of some insight that participatory photography is appropriate uh, to the objectives of that project or in in that particular context. Uh, because what we often do is we have done participatory photography before, so let's do it also because we have done it before and. The question as to how suited it is to the project or the context well, that we are trying to Well, thank you very much, and uh, uh, time has arrived to close this seminar. But I would like to tell you that you will be able to find this video in a few hours from now in the Water Channel website, as well as then the website of IEG Delft in the session of alumni, and in the YouTube uh, website of IEG Delft. And also, I would like to invite you in both or three addresses that to find out the other previous seminars of this series of alumni and partners on last seminar, as well as another interviews and information that could be really interesting for you. So this series, we have done it with IHE, with the collaboration of the Water Channel. I would like to thank the speakers of today, Leneke and Abraham, for their presentation as well as for all the work they have done during the year with us and all the IHE colleagues that work with me and that are behind the screens, Nadine Sanders, Raquel Dos Santos, and Bing Bin Glass. And last but not least, this is the last seminar, but I would like to welcome you for the next year series that we are willing to start in February. And on that opportunity, we will have possibly an alumnus and partner person that no doubt he will have a very interesting topic to share with all of you. So nothing else to say. Thank you very much for your participation. Very active, nice question and see you next year in the next seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.